Hello, my name is Gopal Rao. I'm the editor of MRS Bulletin with the Materials Research Society, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. And I really want to welcome you all to today's MRS webinar on a new, much faster approach to low mobility hall measurements presented by Lakeshore Cryotronics. Now, this is, of course, a very interesting topic. Silicon and other mainstream materials uh, as they reach technological and physical limitations, new semiconductor materials are clearly needed. Some of these have mobility characteristics that can pose very difficult challenges for haul and transport property characterization. We'll hear more about ways to overcome these challenges during the webinar, of course. First, I'd like to introduce today's presenters, Jeffrey Lindemuth and Kevin Carmichael, both of Lakeshore Cryotronics. Jeff Lindemuth is a senior application scientist with Lakeshore. He received his BS in physics from Penn State University and his PhD in high energy physics from the College of William and Mary, where his research concentrated in the study of weak and strong interactions through the measurements of exotic atom X-rays. Prior to joining Lakeshore, Jeff was with EGNG Princeton Applied Research concentrating on computer-aided measurements and data analysis for electrochemistry, optical spectroscopy, fiber optics, magnetic materials, and high-speed electronics. Since joining Lakeshore in 1993, Jeff's focus has been in the development of measurement systems, including VSMs and Hall effect measurement systems. He also performs application training, working closely with customers to help them better understand measurements obtained from their systems. Jeff Lindemuth is widely recognized as an expert in instrumentation and methods for hall measurements, particularly those involving semiconductor materials. Our other host and moderator is Kevin Carmichael, who is Director of Applications Engineering for Lakeshore. In this position, he works closely with Lakeshore's application scientists focusing on the voice of the customer to drive the company's strategic product direction. He also ensures that Lakeshore's product development roadmap is aligned with the emerging needs of the scientific community. Previously, as a product manager, he worked with Lakeshore product engineering and company management on the introductions of, introduction of new material characterization systems. Kevin received both his BS and master's in physics at Wright State University with a concentration in the study of gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, heterostructure quantum wells. I am very pleased to have Jeff and Kevin presenting this webinar with MRS today. They were agreed to stay on after the webinar for Q&A, so please jot down any questions you have during the webinar. Also at the end of the webinar, we'll explain how you can get your own copy of Lakeshore's new 88 page Hall Effect Measurement Handbook, a resource for both new and experienced materials researchers. And now it's time to get started with the webinar. I will turn this over to Jeff, and here we go. Thank you for the introduction and inviting us here today. Today I'm going to talk about Fast Hall, a new method for hall measurements. The measurement is fast and for most magnetic materials does not require using field reversal. This feature allows using permanent magnets, electromagnets, and superconducting magnets in a more efficient manner. The Hall effect was discovered in 1879 by Edwin Hall. His discovery was that a current flowing in a solid with a magnetic field perpendicular to the current generates a voltage in a direction perpendicular to both. In modern language, the current sees the Lorentz force from the magnetic field and the velocity of the carriers. This force causes an accumulation of charge on the edge, which sets up an electrical field in the direction of the Lorentz force. When the force of the electric field balances the Lorentz force, a new steady state is established. The voltage associated with the electric field is the Hall voltage. It is proportional to the magnetic field, inversely proportional to the charge carrier density. The sign of the Hall voltage is the same as the sign as the carriers. Increasing the speed of the Hall measurement has several advantages. One is a decrease in the effect due to drifts in the measurement. The second is more measurements can be completed in less time. And as I will hopefully convince you, the method can measure lower mobility materials using lower magnetic fields. 
Although I will not discuss this to get today, the high speed allows measurement of time-dependent effects. The whole measurement consists of two measurements. The first is resistivity, typically measured at zero applied field. Typically, we would talk about van der Paul samples, and for this, there is a well-defined method and a well-defined calculation for measuring the resistivity. The second measurement is a Hall voltage, measured with an applied field. From these two measurements, three additional material properties are calculated. Carrier density, Hall mobility, and carrier type. So why is this so hard? If we focus on the Hall voltage measurement, when the voltage is measured, there are really four components to the measured voltage. Only one, the Hall voltage, is the one we want. The others are the misalignment voltage. These, the misalignment voltages are generated by imperfect sample geometry. We will see examples of this later. These are field independent and can be removed by field reversal. Thermoelectric voltages are generated by temperature gradients and material junctions. The, this voltage is independent of current and can be removed by current reversal. Noise and offset errors are due to experimental instrumentation limitations, and it is the job of the instrumentation provider to make these as small as possible. There are also some other Galvano transport effects that are listed here, but we will not discuss these today. This is a standard protocol for measuring the Hall voltage using DC field. A positive voltage is applied, and the Hall voltage is measured at both positive and negative currents. Notice that the sign of both the misalignment and the Hall voltage changes when we change the direction of current. Next, the field is reversed. Now, for a superconducting magnet, that might take 30 minutes or even longer to, to reverse the field. So once the field has been reversed, we again repeat the measurements with the field pointing down, one for positive current, one for negative current, getting the results as shown in the bars. From these four measurements, we can calculate a Hall voltage and without the misalignment voltage. However, if the misalignment voltage has drifted, changed slightly during the measurement, then in fact there will be a residual misalignment voltage in the measurement that is shown here and will be identified as a Hall voltage. So the key to that measurement is that there's no drifts. However, look at this zinc oxide sample. Here's an example of a, of a misalignment voltage drift. The sample is in an oscillating magnetic field. The amplitude of of the oscillations is the Hall voltage and is about 0.75 millivolts. The offset of the misalignment is about 700 millivolts. Over the thousand second measurement time, the misalignment voltage drifted about three millivolts. If standard DC methods were used with the thousand second reversal time, the measured Hall voltage would be 1.75 millivolts or an error of over 200%. So now we're gonna look a little bit at the origins of the misalignment voltage. The misalignment voltage is the measured Hall voltage at zero field. If a sample is perfectly symmetric, the left-hand plot here, the Hall voltage is at zero field is zero. This, these plots here show streams, the arrows that are the current flow, and equal potential surfaces, which are the equal potential surfaces. So in, in the figure on the left, the square contacts for the measurement are at the same potential, and the voltage is, is zero. In the middle configuration is the exact same one as on the left, except the contacts have been deformed. So it breaks the symmetry. And so now the Hall voltage is 66 millivolts. This would be 660 times the Hall voltage at one Tesla, because at a one Tesla applied field, the modeled material has a Hall voltage of 100 microvolts. And then finally, in the third configuration, on the, on the left right-hand side is the same sample, except now it's a rectangle with an aspect ratio of 0.9. In, in this case, the misalignment voltage would be 127 millivolts. One method to improve the situation is to use AC magnetic fields. Then the Hall voltage becomes an AC voltage, while the misalignment and thermal electric voltages remain DC. Modern lock-in amplifiers are very good at separating the AC signal from the DC signal. However, there is a new voltage that, that appears in this measurement that's due to the inductive pickup because you have wires, coils, setting in a time-varying magnetic field. So there's a term proportional to, this, to the uh, sine omega t, the quadrature term. However, again, lock-ins are very good at, at separating the in-phase and out-of-phase signals, so this doesn't present a real problem as long as the inductive pickup is not too big. Mm -hmm. Finally, because of, of this 
this term, the frequency must be small, typically on the order of a tenth of a hertz, because the large inductance of the electromagnets make it very difficult to change the field rapidly with any type of reasonable side power supply. So this leads to slow measurements. The slow measurement of the AC method has its own problems. If the misalignment voltage slowly drifts during the measurement, the frequency of the components drift in the bandpass of the lock-in, and they will be measured as part of the Hall voltage. And in fact, this is the fundamental problem with the AC field measurement. Here, here's an example of some measurements on business palladium oxide, and they were measured at different currents. One would intuitively expect that as you increase the current of a measurement, the signal will go up and the signal to noise ratio should also improve. However, this is not the case when we're measuring with the AC field method, because as you increase the current, you're also increasing the self-heating. It heats more with higher currents, temperature changes more rapidly, and you get more of the misalignment voltage into the hall measurement, and so you get a decrease in the signal to noise ratio. So this is an example with an AC field where you have to actually use a lower current to get a good measurement. Here's another manifestation of, of the same problem. This is a measurement on P3HT samples were done over 100 times. So this, this is a 10 hour measurement, it's an overnight measurement. And the orange curve on here is, is the measured temperature of the sample with a platinum sensor placed near the sample. The measurement was just done at room temperature. And we can see that in the first 20 measurements, which would be a, approximately two hours of of measurement time, the temperature of the sample changed about 0.8 degrees, and then it more or less stabilized over the rest of the measurement. And you can see in the blue lines, the hall voltages, that in the first 20 measurements, the one, the, the spread seems to be a bit, little bit higher, and it seems to be a little bit different average value than the, than the last 80 measurements. So the, the, you can see how these drifts cause the hall measurements to change in time. Okay, let's look for a better way to solve this problem. So there's a reciprocity theorem in electrical network theory that everyone probably saw at least once in their college education that says that if you have a current source attached to a, a network and a voltmeter attached to two other, another port on the network, and if you interchange those two devices, and if the sample network is linear and passive, then the voltage reading will be exactly the same. So this, this is a well-known, well-understood uh, reciprocity theorem. But what about the case where there's a magnetic field present, as it would be in a Hall measurement? Then, in fact, the reciprocity theorem that we showed previously doesn't apply anymore, and we have to go to a, an extension of it. We call that extension the reverse field reciprocity theorem. And what th that theorem says that, again, if I start with a network, a sample that's linear and passive with a current source in, on one port and a voltmeter on another port setting in a magnetic field, say a positive magnetic field, then if I interchange the current source and voltmeter, I have to also change the direction of the magnetic field to get the same voltage reading. So, so this is a rather important result. And, and as uh, Sample found in, in the reference that you saw there, it was published in 1987, we can use this to do a Hall measurement without doing field reversal. Because in, indeed, we can just in, get the same voltage measurement of the, reverse, of the field reversal by only interchanging the volt, voltmeter and current source in the measurement. So one application of this theorem is, is a method called spinning current. Now spinning current has been around for a long time. It's a method used in the Hall sensor community and it removes the misalignment voltage from a Hall sensor, which you would see in a, in, in a Gauss meter as the offset, when it, where it's obviously not possible to, to reverse the field. And this technique is based on this field reciprocity theorem that we just saw. And, and it does indeed show that reversing the field gives the same voltage as not re reversing the field, but interchanging the voltage and current leads. So spinning current method looks something like this diagram that we have here. This, this is a sample setting in a, a positive field. And if we start in the upper left-hand corner, the 
current source is connected across contacts one and three, the voltmeter is between two and four. So, so if we set there, if we go to the right top where we interchange the voltmeter and the current source, we've done field reversal. So now we've, we've, we've measured the field reversal at positive current. And then if we go down from the left-hand column to the bottom left-hand corner, we had done current reversal where, where the, the direction of the, of the current has changed. And finally, on the diagonal is both current reversal and field reversal. So we have these four measurements as we do the spinning current. Typically, it's called spinning currents because you can imagine going around in a circle, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and, and getting the, the measurement that you need. So here's the algebra behind the spinning current method. There are four measurements in a spinning current method, numbered one, two, three, and four here. And they consist of uh, four different components, a Hall voltage, the I R H B over T, the misalignment voltage, the I alpha rho, rho is the resistivity of the material over T. And then there's two different thermoelectric voltages, um, um, labeled one and two. There's two of them because the current source is connected to two different sets of contacts. So with, with these four measurements, you can then calculate a Hall voltage with the simple uh, calculation that's shown in the, at the bottom there. Uh, and so this, this, says, this is the spinning current method. As I said, it's used in the Hall sensor community. Now in the Hall sensor community, of course, the materials typically have high mobility. They're typically pretty low resistance um, because that's what you want for, for a good uh, Hall sensor. And so the question is, can we extend this technique to, ma to materials of lower mo mobilities? Another way to look at this is shown in this diagram. Here we have four states in the top line here that represent AC current. They, they are a positive current, a negative current, a positive current, and a negative current. So as we do this switching, and the switching, of course, can be done with uh, solid state switching and easily can be done in a kilohertz, uh, gives us a square wave AC current being applied to, this, to the sample. In the bottom line is switching back and forth to switch the direction of the field. So now we have an AC field where we go left from right, B plus, B minus, B plus, B minus. And so that's an AC field. It's a square wave AC field. It's not what you would normally think of applying to a sample. Most power supplies wouldn't be able to, to do that. But nevertheless, it is still an AC field. Now, if, if you recall, in, in the AC field method that we described before with low frequency sine wave excitation, we were able to measure very low ma material because we could separate the Hall voltage, which was proportional to the field frequency, from the misalignment voltage, which was proportional to the current frequency, which in that case happened to be a DC current. So the misalignment voltage was DC, the AC field was at at the Hall voltage was at an AC field frequency, and we used a lock-in to separate them. So here we can do a similar kind of thing, a little more flexibility, because I now have a two-frequency AC current AC field method to, to do the measurement, but I can I can change the, both the, the frequency of the current, which will determine the frequency of the misalignment voltage, and the frequency of the field, which would determine the frequency of the Hall voltage. So this helps explain why the spinning current method does not work well for low mobility materials. The spinning current method, which is, as we described, goes one, two, three, four around that square that we talked about earlier on, if you look at it carefully, separates the Hall voltage and the misalignment voltage in phase space, or 90 degrees apart. Now, in principle, the lock-in can, can separate that, but it does, does require a very high dynamic range. If, if the misalignment voltage is one volt and the Hall voltage is a microvolt, which is not an unreasonable thing to, to try and measure, this would require 120 dB of dynamic range in the measurement. That's a lot of, that's a lot of dynamic range. It can be done, but it's, it's not an easy measurement to do. The fast Hall method optimizes a spinning sequence for measurement of low mobility materials. So let's look at some real results. 
Okay, the first table here is a comparison of conventional DC field hall measurements to the M91 fast hall measurements. The, the uh, DC measurements uh, have limited mobility range, and so these, these materials have mobility five and above. They're not super low, but, but they're not an easy measurement. Uh, the, uh, you can see there the conventional DC field hall measurement, and it took about uh, two minutes, 114 seconds, to do those measurements. And you see the tabulated hall voltages and, and standard errors of those measurements over that time. And the fast hall method gets the, almost exactly the same hall voltages, very comparable standard errors, and it does the measurement in 30 seconds or less. The second table down below, there are materials that have a mobility low enough that require the AC field method. Uh, so, so there's two samples there. One's a polysilicon sample. It has a mobility as measured with the AC field method of 2.42 and the fast hall method measured at 2.5. And then there's a titanium oxide sample and has a pretty high, higher resistivity, 137,000 ohms per square. And it has a Mobility is measured by the AC field method of 0.01, and we've got the same 0.01 mobility when measured by the fast hall technique. So these these show very good agreement on on these these samples. The AC field hall methods, by the way, took an hour to do those measurements, and the uh, fast hall method would do those measurements in about two minutes. So another very common measurement in, in Hall effect measurements is a, is a Hall measurement on a sample with a gate bias. You'd like to look at the Hall voltage as a function of gate bias to, to look at carrier concentrations, for example, as a function of gate bias. <clears throat> so in a sample with a gate bias, we now have six ports instead of the four ports we've been talking about. And it's an obvious question, does the reciprocity theorem still hold in this case? So th this is a sample of graphene uh, provided by Richard Kyle of our Arizona State University uh, that we measured with both the fast hall system and the 8425 is a lecture cryotronics uh, hall measurement system in a superconducting magnet uh, probe station. Uh, so so this these measurements were were done by both methods. Uh, the fast hall is the blue line that you see there. The, 8425 is the orange line that you see there, and they fall right on top of each other. You, you can uh, see the hall voltage changes signs at about a 41, 42 volt gate bias on this graphene sample. So the time per measurement point uh, with the 8425, which had to include field reversal, of course, uh, two tests of the superconducting magnet was 510 seconds. Well, the fast hall sample was done in 115 seconds per point. Okay, so we can put all this functionality into a single electronics box, which we see here. It's the Lakeshore M91 fast hall controller. It contains both all the contact check, resistivity, and hall effect measurements in one box. Uh, it, it does all the measurements, it does all the calculations, and, and returns the high level results for you. When you use the fast haul method, it eliminates the need for field reversal. You can use it not only with electromagnets, but also permanent magnets and superconducting magnets. It's, it's fast. Uh, this box is configured for 70 millisecond haul measurements, uh, but we have achieved as fast as 10 millisecond uh, haul measurements uh, in, in other configurations. So this is ideal for low mobility materials and detecting small changes in the haul voltage. So this is a simpler, more convenient way of doing a hall measurement. It's all in one instrument in, in the optimization mode that's available in it, it. The box can automatically select excitation and measurement levels. It, it does that based on doing contact check measurements and, and finding uh, what currents are required to get a, a good uh, ohmic check on, on your sample. Uh, it, it can then automatically execute uh, both the resistivity and hall measurements based on the results that came from that uh, contact check measurement. Uh, it provides complete hall analysis and it is an easy to use system to integrate with existing lab systems and, and it's ready to go. However, for the advanced user who wants complete control over all the parameters of measurement, 
you you have that option as well. You can control every every piece of the measurement that you want. Every gain, every current selection uh, can can be controlled by the user if if that is the method that they prefer to use. You can uh, also get retrieve from the from the box not only the the high level, what's my mobility, what's my resistivity kind of numbers, but it also provides detailed measurements of every voltage and every current measurement. Were you in overload? Were you in compliance? Absolutely all the information necessary to, to debug a measurement that has gone wrong. In addition to the hall measurement and resistivity measurement, it, it also has a four wire measurement. So you can do other types of measurements that are not hall resistivity or contact check. It also supports, besides the fast haul measurements, the standard traditional DC haul measurement. This is absolutely required for a haul bar measurement because the reciprocity theorem does not apply to a haul bar. And, and so we have uh, uh, the, the DC haul measurement in the box as well. So you can do either one of them. So here's the M91 coupled to a permanent magnet tabletop system. This is a system that you're going to see a demo of uh, after this talk. There'll be a video uh, demonstrating real measurements on, on this system. The permanent magnet for room temperature measurements is a one Tesla magnet. It uh, uses the M91 and no field reversal required if, if you do the fast haul measurement. As I mentioned, you can also do the uh, traditional DC field haul if you wish. Uh, the uh, connections are high quality triax cable. Everything's guarded right down to, this, to the uh, sample connections. Uh, the sample is measured in a light tight box and it's closed in a Faraday cage. Uh, it comes with uh, Lakeshore's MeasureLink software that provides us flexible scripting language. There's a, a prepackaged scripts that come with it that provide very sophisticated uh, measurements uh, for, for the uh, hall measurement. Uh, but you can, if you uh, wish to do something a little bit different, uh, you can write your own scripts, either starting with ours or from scratch. The, the of course, as I mentioned, there's optimized message for ease of use, uh, and it, it comes with uh, an easy to use prover card. So we'll see the, the demonstration of that here in just a minute. So in conclusion, we have developed a fast haul measurement system based on the reciprocity theorem. It can do the measurements very fast. One of the key advantages is the magnetic field does not have to be reversed during the measurement. We can perform a single hall measurement 15 times a second or faster. Fast hall method can measure over a wide range of mobilities. And although we didn't talk about that today, transient hall measurements are possible. Of course, any product development of, of this scale group depends on many of the engineers at Lakeshore Cryotronics, and I wish to thank every one of those. So thank you very much, and we'd like to hear your questions at the end of this webinar. But first, I'd like to go to that demonstration that I mentioned earlier. Specifically, Kevin Carmichael, my colleague here at Lakeshore, will be showing how the M91 works as part of a tabletop system that we were calling our fast haul station. Now, I should mention that for this, we had originally planned to demonstrate it live to you today. But given the circumstances we're in with a lot of us working remotely, it is impossible. So what we're seeing is a recorded demo, and in the end, we'll both be available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. I'm Kevin Carmichael, product manager here at Lakeshore Cryotronics, and today we'd like to do a demonstration of Lakeshore's new tabletop hall measurement system and the M91 fast hall measurement controller. The M91 is an all-inclusive hall measurement instrument. It combines a voltage source, current source, voltage and current measurement, switch, and analysis all in a single unit. This allows us a very easy platform for integrating an existing measurement or as the basis of a new hall measurement system. I used the term fast hall earlier. Fast hall refers to the technology that we have uh, built into the system. It provides us two main benefits. First benefit, is that it extends our mobility range three orders of magnitude on the low end. So we're, instead of being limited to about one centimeter squared per volt second, we're now down at 10 to the minus three 
centimeters square per volt seconds on hull mobility. The other advantage is it allows us to avoid having to do field reversal on our DC step. So we can essentially do a complete measurement at zero field and then with just one either positive or negative magnetic field to do the hall voltage step. Both of those are, are great time savers and will come into play and we'll show you a little bit about that when we get making the measurement. Now I'd like to show you the back panel of the M91. We'll show you how we have this connected. Okay, now that we have the instrument turned around, let's take a look at the back panel connections. On the power side, we have a universal input power supply, so the mains coming in are between 90 and 220 VAC. We have two uh, communication connections. We have a USB-B connection or an Ethernet connection for going to the computer. And then we also have a USB-C connection uh, to help us pull data off um, with, a, say, a thumb drive. Uh, on the measurement side, what we have are these six connections are all triax guarded connections. Uh, the, they're numbered one through four here in the middle. That's for a van der Paul measurement. And then five and six are labeled here for going to do a hall bar. Uh, we also have some analog and digital IO. So these are BNC connectors and we have an analog input and an analog output. Those are each plus or minus 10 volt range. And then uh, four digital inputs and four digital outputs. The digital I.O. and the analog I.O. are not specifically used in our basic measurements, but can be used to integrate the M91 with your experiment. So now that we've had a chance to look at the back panel, let's go ahead and move this back around and look at the components of our tabletop system. First of all, we have the M91-HR. That's the high-resistance version of our fast haul measurement controller. We've combined that with a um, sample holder, a very high-precision sample holder, and magnet system. And then all of that is being governed by the MeasureLink software, which is helping us provide a very simple and easy way to make, make measurements. So looking a little bit closer at what we've done here, the sample holder we've integrated from our 8400 premium electromagnet system. This is a very high performance sample holder. It is completely electrically shielded, including the top of the sample well here. Sample well provides us a complete electrical shield all the way up so that really minimizes electrical noise. We also have guarded triax connections coming in from the M91-HR. Those guards are maintained all the way through our sample holder. And in fact, all the way as much as possible down through our sample card directly to the connections. So we'll get into the sample cards in a minute, but we all we do have soldered and probed versions of these cards. And we'll go through a little bit of that in the demo here. Um, we also have a purge valve here. This is a low pressure relief valve and a purge connection in the back of the holder here. That allows us to have a nitrogen purge and flood the measurement compartment to free it of O2 for some samples that are sensitive to oxygen. We also have a vacuum. We can, we can connect a small vacuum pump here. And with a modified top here, we can go with some hermetically sealed triax connections and provide a vacuum option so that we can actually have the sample in vacuum as well. So all of those things go together to really make this sample holder very appropriate for high precision measurements. So measuring very, very small hall voltages and doing analysis on some very, what are typically very tough samples in this system. What I'd like to do now is, is show you our sample card and make some measurements. and put this probing card in. Okay, and then what we have here is a number of spring-loaded contacts. And I have a, this is a P-type 
silicon, P-type silicon, has a mobility of about 70 centimeters squared per volt second. So, okay, it looks pretty good. Okay, I'll go ahead and load that sample. So let me go ahead and get that started. Now, MeasureLink is a, our system software. It applies to all of our new systems and all of also all our important instruments like the M91. What we have is the ability to develop drivers for not only our own instrumentation, also third-party instrumentation. We can build those using scripts into nice sequences of measurements. And it's very, very flexible system, but it's also very simple to use out of the box. So without spending too much time on measure, measure link itself, this is the monitor panel. The monitor panel shows you what measurements you have for this M91 demonstration measurement. We're going to have the M91 fast haul controller and it's on. And then I have a permanent magnet driver that's on also. And that'll control, allow us to control, easily control the status of the magnet, whether it's in zero Tesla position or it's, it's one Tesla position. Okay, so to make a measurement here, what we're going to do is come to the sequence panel and under the measurements, I'm going to go to M91 and select the multipurpose Hall effect analysis. Okay, we get a couple of measurement screens that come up here. This one is preferences. It defines a directory to save data to and what data we're saving along with a sample ID if you want it. Also, we have uh, the units here, whether it's in CGS or SI. So we're just going to leave it at CGS. Here on this uh, group, we have standard resistance and high resistance. The M91 comes with a standard resistance range up to 10 mega ohms. The high resistance option is the M91-HR model, and that one goes up to 200 giga ohms. This can be upgraded after the purchase. Also, we have a sample thickness parameter here. You can either leave it not specified, in which case the resistance, uh, resistivity and carrier concentrations will be reported as sheet concentrations, or you can put in a value for the thickness and it will carry, do a bulk carrier concentration and uh, report the resistivity in ohm centimeters. Now these other parameters, I'll leave alone. These are defaults for the blanking time or the switching, you know, basically a settling time after the switches are arranged and a compliance voltage. So here in standard resistance, we are sourcing current. So our compliance voltage, it's only a 10 volt maximum with the M91. So that's appropriate for most things, uh, not a concern, but if you do have a lower compliance voltage that you want, you can specify it there. Okay, so now I'll hit start and I get four additional screens. Typical hall analysis, we'll do a contact check resistivity check and a fast haul analysis. One of the nice things that the M91 also has is the ability to do an optimization. So I'm going to go ahead and select that first. What the optimization does is it runs a series of contact checks under different excitation values. It's going to look at all the currents and choose the best current to excite at and it's also going to then optimize the blanking time. So all of those things will be set automatically. And then I'll also go ahead and check resistivity and hall measurements, and then we'll, we'll operate them. Okay, so really that's all I've done is done the optimization. And you notice here when I've selected resistivity and hall, when I'm doing the optimization, I'm not specifying a specific excitation value, but I'm using it linked. What the linked indicates is that whatever the best current in the contact check is determined, and that optimized value will then be used in the resistivity. and then. And then that will also be used in the hall measurement and use link in to use the resistivity. So it really becomes a very automated process. Okay, so all I need to do is really hit start here. And with the start, what you can see now is that we're doing the optimization. And now after the optimization is now complete, it did, it did the contact check. It's also going to do the resistivity. So we also have the, the data being updated in measure link. Now, Basically, the software has stopped us and the magnet driver is telling us that it needs us to move it to one, mag one Tesla. So I'll just slide my permanent magnet in. 
and hit return to enter. Now it's going to do finish up the hall measurement. That's now complete. And I have the complete, well, yes, I'll save it. And I have the complete summary as well as all the other data files listed here. With MeasureLink, all of this information is customizable, but this summary report is very nice. It says for the contact check, it shows us the R squared values. We have a minimum 0.9999 or higher. This is the fit index of the linear fit for the contact check. So those on this sample, those are all fine. On the resistivity, it goes through and tells us the number of samples that were run. Sheet resistivity here of 281 milliohms per square. And also gives you a statistical analysis of the 10 samples. Gives you the error bars. And also lists the result for A and B. So we, both A and B geometries where we're measuring along two of the edges and then we rotate 90 and can measure the other two. So we have some indication that our sample is very symmetric. For the fast haul analysis, here it shows us that the mobility is 73 centimeters squared per volt second. Um, sheet carrier concentration was 3 times 10 to the 17th per square centimeter. Hall voltage that we measured was 650 nanovolts or 0.6 microvolts. So that's actually quite small hall voltage, uh, and yet we were able to get very good analysis. Now, one thing I did not cover earlier is um, when we did the analysis, well, let me go back to the page. One of the pages that we reserve is our the page that we have here showing what measurements we ran. We have a minimum signal to noise ratio that we can specify, and then also a maximum number of samples. So, so if I go back to the summary, what we did is we said we'd like to have a, sam a signal to noise ratio of at least 30 to 1, and then, but, but we don't want to go over 40 samples. Both of those are independently be able to be specified. And so what we did here, of course, on the resistivity, it's a much easier measurement. So it just ran 10 samples. Had uh, We were over our signal to noise, no problem. Here on the fast haul, I had set it up so that it was able to run uh, 30, so it, it took 13 samples, and it actually ran and, and found all 13 of those to be P-type. Of course, as your noise band increases and your haul voltage decreases, you can get to a point where you might have an indication of it might statistically come out as N-type, maybe one out of every 10 times or one out a few times, depending on your haul voltage. So here we can say that we all 13 of the samples that ran were able to be measured as p-type. So we have a nice analysis here. Now in addition, the other, we saved some other things here. We do have a chart showing the contact check. If our contact check had failed, one of them not being, or one of them being below 0.9999, then what we could have come back here and seen is, is the shape. We might have been passing too much current through it or the, it just might not have been a good contact. And so you can use this to kind of figure out which contacts you need to work on on your sample and make them better. In addition, we have tables. We are also producing the, this is just the IV data for each of those contact checks. And then have the same for resistivity and fast haul. Now, one of the other things that we do, and, and this is, uh, let me, let me uh, open this raw data file. One of the things we do is we capture a data file for each of the three steps. And this, this data is really just a historical record of every single measurement that was made to determine the uh, hall voltage and our hall analysis. And so what it has here at the uh, set, up, set up at the beginning, these are all the things that we passed into it. It has a complete list of the output. And then for each sample that was run, each of the 13 samples, it goes through and, and tells you the information, but also shows you each exact measurement that was made. So here's our, this is our positive field configuration with positive excitation. Then we have the negative excitation here, so that's showing you doing the current reversal. And we have all of the measurements completed. And this is straight down through all of the measurements. And that's, that really can be useful if you're having a problem with the measurement. Uh, the M91 isn't a real black box. So you're able to look into the data and really make it intelligent decisions about what's going wrong with your sample. So all of that is always retained. When I hit the save button after the end of the run, it saved all of that, all of those data files in one file.
So that about wraps it up. Thanks for joining me for this demonstration of Lakeshore's new tabletop haul measurement system and the M91 fast haul measurement controller. For more information, please visit our product page at www.lakeshore.com or contact sales at sales at lakeshore.com. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff and Kevin. Um, that was an interesting uh, presentation on fast, uh, low mobility hall measurement, as well as good explanation for the fast hall technology, how it's used at the fast hall station, and how measurements are made. A um, number of questions have indeed come in from the audience as we expected, uh, and we we'll try to go through as many as we can in the time that we have. Uh, if we don't get to your question, please feel free to email Lakeshore at sales at lakeshore.com. Um, it is also on your screen. So with that, uh, let's start with the question. So here's the first one. When is it beneficial to use uh, AC hall measurements? So this is Jeff here. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, one of the times that you need to use the AC field hall is if you need to do a uh, low mobility material and you're using a hall bar configuration because the uh, fast hall technique does not uh, uh, work with uh, hall bars uh, because <clears throat> a hall bar configuration is designed to be a one-dimensional current flow situation. And, and the uh, reciprocity theorem that we spoke of here is really talks about two-dimensional current flows in, in electric fields. So uh, the, the hall bar is not suitable for the fast hall technique. So you, so you need the AC field for uh, uh, hall bar measurements. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. So here's the uh, next question from the audience. So you mentioned the high dynamic range when RXX is large as compared to RXY, and misalignment voltage is large compared to VH. Is there the same issue with large contact resistance compared to sample resistance, both RXX and RXY? Uh, samples in the uh, milli-omega range regime and contacts in the 10 uh, ohm regime how much of a problem is it? Yeah, so that can be a really big problem. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different than the uh, problem of misalignment voltage. Uh, there, there are two issues that you'll see with, with that uh, situation. <clears throat> the first is that uh, uh, you'll be a, uh, have a large voltage drop over the contacts. So you'll have to put in... Uh, more volt, more current than, than you would really like to into your sample, perhaps, to, to get a reasonable voltage measurement across the sample, which is the one that you really want. That, that's, that's the voltage you're, you're measuring. And that can then lead to problems of self-heating because the high resistance in the contacts, the, all the heating is going to happen in the contact itself. So, the, so that just brings the second part of, of when we say ohmic contacts, or this, there's a sort of a second part of that that doesn't often get measurement mentioned, but not only do you want ohmic contacts, you want low resistance ohmic contacts, and, and that, that can be difficult to obtain, but is very important to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we have the next question. What is the limit of the field in the fast hall method? Um, it's likely, likely uses low fields, uh, but, but could you comment on the limit of the field? So we have used the, the fast hall method, the M91 box, and, and measured samples in fields as high as 9 Tesla in the superconducting magnet and uh, get good consistent results between that measurement and measurements done with, say, a standard DC hall measurement uh, uh, in, on the same material. So, no, I, I don't think there's any inherent uh, limits to the magnetic field uh, values other than 
issues that you would have in, in standard hall measurements. If you have high fields and low temperatures, you, you, you start getting quantum oscillations and, and different effects come in, into play. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, a more of a practical question next. What are the sample dimensions required for the uh, M91 fast hall measurement? So that, that depends entirely on your uh, uh, sample holder that you're using. Um, in the uh, fast hall station that you saw demonstrated here, the uh, standard uh, sample size is 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. Uh, but uh, you, depending on the magnet that you're using and your configuration, uh, you can have much larger or smaller samples. All right. Um, and another sort of a practical question for the system. Does the MRI provide all of the measurements get an ASTM consistency checks? Yes, yeah, so the M91 uh, controller, when it does the, the hall measurement, and there's a sequence of measurement that needs to you go through. For, for a Van der Paul resistivity measurement, there's eight IV, per, eight IV measurements that are required to, to calculate the resistivity. A Van der Paul hall measurement requires four uh, IV measurements to calculate the hall voltage, and then you repeat that for however many samples you wish to average over. So there's a lot of data. Every bit of that data is is available over the SCIPI interface, uh, so the user can extract that data and save it. And the M91 also does the standard ASTM consistency checks, F values for the uh, uh, solution to the Van der Paul equation, the consistency of the geometries uh, uh, in the measurement, uh, all those, all that data is saved as well as any overload or compliance conditions in the measurement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so here's another somewhat of a practical question. Can I easily, from a member in the audience, can I easily say, and use M91 with third-party sample holder, magnet platforms, and probe stations? Yes, yeah, so, so the M91, as, as Kevin pointed out in, in the video, has six triax connectors on the back to connect to your sample. Uh, your sample can be mounted in, in any sample holder or magnet platform, either uh, the standard ones uh, that Lakeshore would provide or the, your own user. Uh, supplied ones. The, this, this box was uh, designed not only for the integrated systems, but also for the do-it-yourselfers who want to build their own system. The uh, MeasureLink software that, that comes with the system uh, can easily be extended and modified to, to uh, interface to a wide variety of magnets and, and field control platforms. Very good. Sounds great. Um, so the next question from a member of the audience, as far as the transient measurements go, what is the speed of response to the system uh, or the highest frequency signal that can be measured? So the, the transient measurements uh, are uh, still very uh, experimental with our system. Uh, we're, we're still working through the, the best ways to do those. We, we've published some uh, uh, conference proceedings on, on some of those measurements. Uh, we, the highest measure, measurement rate for a hall voltage measurement that, that we have done is uh, 100 hall voltage measurements per second. Uh, so that, that's sort of going to be the limit of, of what uh, the uh, transient response can do. Right. Very good. And then this is, um, again, a so a practical question based on the demonstration. What is the purpose of the component name PT on the card holding the sample? So that, that is a patent temperature sensor that's mounted on, on the card. Uh, the, that sensor comes out through uh, the uh, uh, center connector on, on the uh, sample holder that Kevin was showing. Uh, and uh, you can, the user can then hook that uh, platinum sensor up to a temperature monitor and be able to monitor the uh, temperature of the sample uh, 
during the measurement. The uh, fast haul station that, that we showed here today uh, does come with an option for a, a liquid nitrogen uh, doer, if you will. It, uh, you, can, you can immerse your sample in liquid nitrogen. It's a fixed point liquid nitrogen temperature. It's not a variable variable temperature, you put it in, in your liquid nitrogen and it gets cold, and, but then that platinum sensor can, can read the temperature for you while it's getting cold. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, so we still have quite, quite a number of questions, uh, maybe a few more minutes to answer some of these. Sure. Um, so maybe we'll start with number 13 on the list, Jeff. Um, so to what temperature can uh, haul voltage or carrier concentration be measured uh, in the M91 system? So that really is a, a uh, question that depends on, on your sample. Um, and there, there are a couple effects there. Uh, if, as you get cold, to, for instance, if, if you're measuring silicon, uh, once you get below about 50 Kelvin, you begin to get carrier freeze out and, and the, the uh, hall voltage begins to get pretty small, so it becomes difficult to, to measure. Uh, if, if you have materials that you can measure at lower temperatures, as I mentioned previously, when you get to real low temperatures, you begin to see quantum oscillations at high field, and, and that begins to affect the limit of, of your temperature. But, it, but the, the limits are really determined by your material and not by the M91 itself. Okay, very good. So the next question relates um, to the software side, I guess. Is the scripting language used a standard language, such as Lua script? So the uh, scripting language is uh, uh, a language called uh, WinRap. It's a commercially purchased uh, scripting engine that we integrated into our MeasureLink software. It's, it's very similar to uh, uh, Visual Basic uh, language. Very good. Um, so, again, this is, uh, I, I think this must be in the information that we provide, but it's, it's a very important piece of information to, to have, number 15. What is the range of mobilities that can be measured in the system? Yes, so, so that's a, uh, a good question. Uh, the, uh, as, as we demonstrated in, in this slide set, we certainly have measured uh, mobility as low as 0.01. Uh, uh, to, to measure lower than that, it, uh, it gets to be complicated because it's the material, typically the materials with, with mobilities in that range tend to be very unstable. And, and so you measure them one day and you get one value, and you measure them the next day and you get another value. And you don't really know what, what's causing those changes. Um, certainly with the uh, AC field option in, in our standard systems, we've, we've measured mobilities under 0.01. Uh, and uh, we should, uh, should be, we should be able to, with the M91 measure, mobilities under 0.01. All right, very good. So I'm jumping to number 16 and next. So what is the highest resistance of a sample uh, that can be measured in the M91 system? So, so the M91 as a instrument, when measuring a resistor, Okay, can can measure up to 200 gigahertz. Um, when when you uh, connect the box to a sample holder, triax cables, contacts on the sample, uh, capacitance in, in the cables, and, and all those issues that can begin to limit the the range of, of resistances. So, for instance, in the fast haul station that you saw. Uh, demonstrated today, we respect that the highest resistance is one gig ohm, and, and for Lakeshore that means we guarantee you can measure a sample, not, not just a resistor, but a sample at, with a re resistance of a one gig ohm. Um, if, if the customer is careful how they prepare contacts and how they mount the sample and how they use the sample, they may be able to do somewhat better than that, but 
but those are the typical ranges in which uh, uh, we guarantee the system can do a measurement. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, number 20 on the list now, uh, how easy is it to, for the M91 system to integrate for low temperature measurements? So, so the, the real issue when uh, doing the low temperature measurements is, is what does your cryostat look like and, and what does your temperature control will look like uh, because that, that uh, uh, determines the uh, temperature and then it's, it's easy to, uh, the, the M91 can do the hall measurement uh, in uh, their sample in the cryostat. Uh, the uh, uh, measure link software that you saw here uh, is, uh, uh, can come standard with, with uh, drivers for the Lakeshore 336 temperature controller and, and sensors. So, so if you're using those products, you can pretty easily integrate it to, in, into a uh, system. If you're using some, some other products uh, for that function, then with the, with the capabilities in the, Lake, in, the, in the MeasureLink software, you can write custom drivers to control uh, whatever the measurement environment is. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so here's uh, the next question, which is number 27. Um, this is very interesting. Will the system work for very thin films, say, two nanometers thickness uh, for hall measurements? So there are a couple issues with measuring samples that uh, thin. Uh, one is getting contacts on the sample that don't punch through the sample or destroy the sample. Uh, so, so that's a practical consideration. Um, uh, if the uh, sample is uh, uh, that thin, of course, the resistivity goes up, uh, the misalignment voltage comes up. So that, that all uh, provides problems uh, in doing the measurement. You just need to be more careful in doing the measurement. Uh, but uh, in, in, yes, I mean, we, we certainly have has measured samples that are uh, that order of magnitude and thickness. They're, they're difficult, but they can be done. Thank you, Jeff. So next, we'll jump to number 34. Um, and there are quite a number of questions here, which is very good from the audience. So the audience member asks, I'm wondering what the structure of the titanium dioxide example that you gave in the talk is, um, that you presented, and is the fast haul system suitable for um, ALD green TiO2 influence, again, you know, the nanometer thickness? Okay, yeah, thank you. So, uh, I don't have the information on the structure here with me. Uh, today, I, I can certainly get that, uh, and uh, I can respond to the to the uh, question uh, later on that. Uh, and and I, I, the uh, titanium oxide (ALD) deposit of titanium oxide um, uh, is is a measurement that the N91 should be able to do. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And again, just, just to let the audience know that we will be sending all of these questions uh, to Lakeshore uh, after, the, after this webinar. So uh, number 39, does this new instrument support LabVIEW program, programming? Can we take the data together with other uh, instruments as well? Yes, so, so it, indeed there will be a LabVIEW driver uh, available from Lakeshore for the N91. It's, it's in development right now, and uh, we, we should have it uh, available in the very near future. And, and so once, once you have that in the LabVIEW environment, then you can easily integrate it with other instruments in that same environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, number 42 is again a practical question. How does the controller integrate with existing Lakeshore products? For example, electromagnetics, um, does the software handle this? So the MeasureLink software is, is the mechanism to, to do that. For instance, uh, 
with with the measurement software, you can use the M91 hall measurement system with our F41 or F71 uh, uh, Tesla meters and a hall probe to, to control the magnetic field through the, the Lakeshore electromagnets and power supplies. And, and yeah, so it's totally integrated uh, in the uh, MeasureLink software. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, let's do one maybe last question before we wrap up, which is what determines the limit of mobility that can be measured with the system? So yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. Uh, typically what happens as, as the mobilities get low, uh, the uh, hall voltages also get low, uh, and, and that really becomes the limit. Uh, with the M91, once your hall voltages get on the order of 100 nanovolts or so, they, they get uh, to be more difficult to measure. Thank you very much, Jeff uh, and, and Kevin, for, for the presentation and, and for the excellent Q&A session here. That's about the time we have for, for all the questions. And if we did not get to your question or if you need more information, um, Please follow up by emailing Lakeshore at sales at lakeshore.com, as I've mentioned before. Also, uh, please be sure to visit lakeshore.com slash HHP uh, on the web to download a free copy of the Hall Effect Measurement Handbook. Uh, this is a really nice resource, especially if you're an educator and would like to share it with your students. I'd again like to thank all of you for attending this special webinar uh, and also thank Jeff and Kevin for the presentations today. If you need to reference this webinar later or would like to share it with a colleague, it will be available as an on-demand webinar from the uh, on-demand webinar library at, you know, through the MIT website. And we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar uh, in this whole MRS on-demand series. So I hope you have a very great rest of the day and thank you very much.